literature lit. All right, today I'm going to talk through the chapter London of Kate Grimble's A Secret River. So if you've seen these videos before, you'll be used to this, but I'm going to be using some icons to help us out along the way. I'm going to use icons to give us an idea about the themes that we'll be talking about. So we've got family, justice and criminality, displacement and isolation, colonisation and the indigenous cultures, social class and poverty. Each of those represents an important theme in the book. And when you see that icon, that means Grenville is giving us a clue into that theme. On top of that, if you see the pink brain logo, that means think. Have a think about how this relates to questions that you might have about the book, what your future has been told you, or what you might have to be writing in future essays. Finally, you'll see quotations in grey, a slightly different font, and you'll have the quotation mark there too. So, I'm going to work through in chronological order through this chapter. It's a long one, so I'm going to break it down into parts. First, we're going to talk about his childhood, then we're going to talk about becoming a man at 14, his apprentice years, his descent into poverty with the freezing of the Thames, and finally, his descent into criminality on top of that. Firstly, then, let's look at childhood. In 1777, William Thornhill was born. He was named after his already dead brother, William. Grenville gives us a, a clear idea of the kind of poverty William has grown into. We already know his brother has died. This is an indication of what we call infant mortality. A lot of children in this period were dying before the age of five, and William Thornhill I was one of those. We also see the poverty in their family. Six-year-old Lizzie was in charge of the younger children. She was in a, a child herself, and... and says she could not sew, but despite this, she was in charge of all of the younger Thornhill children. We see a lot of quotations about poverty in this early chapter. We see that hunger was a, a key theme of their life. He was always hungry. That was a fact of life. We then see cold and always cold. There was a kind of desperation to it, a fury to be warm. Then finally, he had eaten the bedbugs more than once. We see a life of absolute destitute poverty. I recommend reading back through this chapter and finding quotations that match the idea of childhood growing up in poverty. It gives us an idea about how his descent into criminality was almost inevitable. So we start to see both the crushing poverty, but also the isolation of William as well. William shows that he doesn't understand religion. He says God was as foreign as a fish. He says he looks at the stone lions, the steeples, the highest buildings you could see. He says God has so much space. We see that for William, he just doesn't understand this concept of religion like the upper or the middle classes would. He's never been educated in this way. I would say he's segregated and isolated from his own city due to his poverty. His first job is helping Park elect dog feces, a horrific job that really emphasises the poverty that the family faced. We also see the onset of criminality. The young children steal books while Ma watches on. This is our first glimpse that criminality is normalised within this part of society. We then see it increasing. Dan begins to steal with increasing courage, and together they steal with a friend called Collarbone. They steal chestnuts. The chestnuts perhaps suggest that they're stealing their, their stomachs, that it's the hunger that's the drive for them to steal. But don't forget this is Collarbone. We meet him later in the book again, perhaps a foreshadowing of what is to come for both him and for William. Ma and Pa die when William is 13, and Grenford is showing us how fickle family life can be. Mortality rates were much, much higher than they are today, and orphans were a common sight within London during these areas. Once James disappears, the job of supporting the family falls to William. He is aged 13 when this happens. He is a man before the age of 14 and has to take control of his family. So William becomes a man before the age of 14. His first job is as a lumper. If you've seen this in the context video, you'll know that the British Empire is going strong and the Industrial Revolution, uh, Revolution is in full force. Trade is going global. William's job is to load and unload the goods that have come into the Port of London from all over the world. He enjoys this job and works hard. So Grenville is showing us really that poverty that William faces is not a result of a lack of work ethic, but the society that he lives in. We see, however, that William starts to bring his early criminality into the workplace. On seeing colleagues stealing sugar, William takes them to himself, but he gets caught. The punishment is swift and brutal. William is flogged, whipped on the back for a hundred yards along the dock. But then William is just 13. It's easy to see him as a man at this point, but he's not. He's a 13-year-old child. However, the lesson he learned was not to get caught. Collarbone showed him how to tap a cask of brandy with a screw. 
This punishment is not taught him the ways of an honest life, it's just taught him to steal more effectively. And again, we can see Grenville foreshadowing the future when it's Collarbone, the later executed Collarbone, who showed him how to steal more effectively. William begins to spend more time with Sal. Despite not suffering the same poverty as the Thornhills, Sal Middleton's family are unable to have more children. As a result, Mr Middleton sees the strength of William, the work ethic of William, and begins to groom William to take over his family trade as a waterman. William is about to go on the up. All right, so this stage of William's life is his apprenticeship. Mr Middleton really takes care of the entire Thornhill family. As well as giving William an apprenticeship, he also finds sewing work for Mary and Lizzie. Now, William is bound as an apprentice into the Waterman's Hall. It's here again that Will starts to see a completely alien society to that which he's grown up into the city he was born into. A vast mahogany table behind which sat half a dozen men in robes, one weighed down with a great bronze chain over his shoulders. This is something that William has never seen before in his life, and this environment is completely alien. He starts to realise it too, when they start to call Mr Middleton by his first name. He's not experienced that before, he's not seen anyone called Mr Middleton by his first name before. He also comments on Mr Middleton's nervous disposition, the way he looks awkward and tense. This is a different world to what William has been in before. Despite the different culture of the Waterman's Gill, Thornhill excels on the water. He takes great pride in her work. You see quotes like, his blisters never got a chance to heal, they grow to they blur. Again, Grenville is emphasising that despite Thornhill's work ethic, what we see is his later decline back into poverty was not because of his laziness, but because of the situation he was in. William Warstow starts to see a different part of London. The gentry form a large part of the customers that Thornhill carries. These are the upper middle class, the upper class of London society. I quite hear about a woman that he carried was she wore silk stockings with green silk slippers. She seems to flirt with William as well, and we're not quite sure really here what, what the purpose Grenville is trying to bring across to us is, but it possibly shows that despite the fact that she, she was human, she felt his sexuality towards William, we see very clearly from her husband that William knows that she is his property and she's completely unattainable. So we've got this mixing of what is a very human nature, but also what is a completely different alien world to William. William and Sal marry on the day William completes his apprenticeship. Sal has taught him to read at this point, and Mr Middleton gives him the gift of the boat. We really see that perhaps William is on the up and is about to escape poverty. One thing to think about is, I find William's interactions with the gentry incredibly interesting. Read back through that interaction with the gentry woman on the boat and her husband. It's quite interesting. And try and think what observations William makes about her and what do you think Grenville suggests by this? So everything seems on the up for the Thornhills. William and Sal have their first child and begin to form a family of their own. But they quickly descend back into poverty. The River Thames freezes over, plunging those people who work on the river into poverty. Some people are having a great time skating, but if you use it as your livelihood, you are in big trouble. The speed at which William and Sal descend back into poverty shows how fragile this entire economic system is for people living on the poverty line. At the same time, Mr and Mr Middleton both become ill and eventually die. During this, Middleton, Mr Middleton creates a huge debt buying up medicine and exotic fruits to try and save his wife. As a result of that, he loses the home that he's been renting, and also Thornhill's boat that he was given by Mr Middleton is seized. He could not prove it was his boat and it was a gift from Mr Middleton, so it was taken from him. As a result, he becomes a journeyman. That means he rows other people's boats across the Thames for money, but it's a lot less lucrative. At this point, Sal moves into criminality too. What can be on the surface seen as quite a humorous scene, we see Sal unsuccessfully stealing a chicken from their landlord and then throwing it out of the window. Sal also finds this funny, but that's because she hasn't experienced poverty before in the same way that Thornhill has. She finds this descent into poverty quite humorous and stealing and criminality quite funny because she thinks it's a short-term thing. What William understands is that this could well be for the long term. And Thornhill begins to realise that his life is starting to go backwards. Have a think. By making the Thornhills fall into poverty so fast, what do you think Grenville is trying to say? 
So as Thornhill descends deeper into poverty, he descends deeper into criminality. Our first clue of what is to come is when Thornhill's childhood friend, remember him from earlier, Collarbone, is sentenced to hang for stealing brandy. Thornhill and Rob witness this execution. Rob vomits, Thornhill is watching the graphic execution of his friend and despite paying the executioner, it is a brutal, long, drawn out death. When Thornhill returns home, he tells Sal that it is a quick, clean hanging to spare her feelings, but he knows the truth. After taking a job with Mr. Lucas though, Thornhill learns that an expensive load of Brazilian wood is to be delivered. He plans to steal this. Despite seeing his friend executed at the gallows just moments before, he takes him a plan to steal the wood. However, this plan is rumbled by an incredibly suspicious Mr. Lucas. Thornhill has been asking too many questions in the yard of Mr. Lucas the day before. And after a short chase down the river with Yates, Lucas's assistant, Rob ends up dead, drowned in the river, and Thornhill is on the run. Lucas offers a reward for his capture, and indeed he is captured. Thornhill is found and sent to Newgate Prison to await trial. You can see about Newgate Prison and the Old Bailey where the court case is held in the context videos. His court case is short. He has a good lawyer, but frankly, the judge, the jury and the crowd do not care about Thornhill. They are disinterested in his case and see him as a criminal from the moment he walks in. Not only that, we start to see Thornhill see everything around him as alien yet again, like the Waterman's Hall. Quote here, they showed if Thornhill has doubted it, that the judge was a gentry the same way that God was a gentry. Referring back to that earlier passage in the book, showing his alienation from society through religion, now through the criminal justice system. Thornhill, despite being sentenced to execution, does have hope. Sal uses Captain Watson, a regular customer of Thornhill's, and sends letters on behalf of Thornhill to Lord Hawkesbury. These are successful, and Hawkesbury downgrades Thornhill's punishment of execution to transportation to New South Wales. Have a think. I think one of the most interesting parts about this chapter is the court case. Reveal the details closely and how Grenville uses language to show Thornhill's isolation from his own city due to his social class. OK, just to wrap up, I'm going to have a quick skim through the key themes. Feel free to pause at any point and take further notes because I'm going to go through this quite quickly. First, we see Thornhill's own family, troubled uh, family, torn apart by poverty. We, we don't see so much poverty in Sal's family, but we do see the sadness of not being able to have more children. The deaths of all the parents so suddenly show the fragility of life for the working class. And then we see Sal and William struggling to raise their own family towards the end of the chapter. Really, poverty is a key theme and it's the driving force of the whole narrative of London. Nearly all the decisions Thornhill makes stem from poverty or the threat of poverty. The brief moment where we think Thornhill is able to escape poverty after his apprenticeship quickly falls back into chaos and poverty and despair. Social class is seen in the, in the Waterman's Hall, it's seen with the gentry on the river, it's seen in the Old Bailey. Thornhill is not unable to understand this class. The flirtation with the wife of the gentry on the river shows the blurred boundaries perhaps between her being both human but completely alien to Thornhill. There's perhaps an irony at the end that Captain Watson and Lord Hawkesbury use their social class to save Thornhill. And an interesting irony, perhaps you want to think why Grenville chooses to do this. Justice and criminality are a very obvious theme throughout it. Um, criminality is a way of life for many of Thornhill's class um, and oftentimes a necessity. Sell's descent into crime is seen in the context of her never really experiencing true poverty before. The execution of Collarbone, the disinterested of those uh, in, in the Old Bailey when William is being sentenced, shows the brutality and the indifference of the justice system for people of William's class. Finally, displacement and isolation is a theme we would think of much more closely associated to later chapters in Australia. But what is interesting is Grenville makes it very clear that in his own city, Thornhill is sometimes isolated. And again, we link that back to the theme of social class. He is unable to access parts of society, even in the city he was born into. Thanks for watching this. I hope you find it useful. Check out the other videos on the Secret River and don't forget to subscribe to the channel.